Sefer Mishlei, Perek Chav Daled, in the middle of the Perek, Pasuk Ted Vav. In this Pasuk he is talking to a Rasha, to a wicked man. Al Te'erov Rasha, L'nvei Tzadik, Al Te'shoded Rivzo. Translation is, Rasha, a wicked man, do not lurk by the dwelling of a righteous man, do not plunder his resting place. An evil man, a wicked man, may be seeing a righteous man, a good man, who is uh, struggling in his panasa. He was just fired from his job, perhaps, and he may lo- lose his home. And the Rasha is already making plans, he's going to buy the house. Or he's going to approach him and try to, you know, buy him off. Seeing the situation, showing no Rahmanut whatsoever. He's a wicked man after all. Taking advantage, sure. So Shalom Melech tells the Rasha, don't think you can do that. Don't plan on that. Don't anticipate that you're going to end up buying the house. That you're going to take away his neve, his rifzo, his resting place, or his job. Just because you're seeing that he is weakening, that he is struggling, that he's on his way down. Don't think that you can take what is his. Because of the next pasuk that we're going to see. The tzaddik may come down temporarily, but eventually he will recuperate, he will recover. But before we get to that pasuk, I want to talk about a very important point called the hazak tabo. The hazak tabo means that you should support him. When you see another Jew that he's struggling, that he may have to sell his home to make ends meet, support him before he falls. Don't let him fall. When a person is already down, when a person is begging others for help, that's one thing, that's one level of assistance, that we help those that are in need. There is another level of assistance, which is a bigger mitzvah, of a hazak tabo, is litmoch, to support those who are about to fall, so they should not fall. Or those who are struggling, to get them a job, instead of giving them money, a handout, give them a job so they can support themselves. That is a much bigger mitzvah than have him come to you and just beg for money. So there's a big mitzvah that has actable to support those who are, who are about to come down. And this, was, this unfortunately was a very familiar scene back in the late 80s, early 90s, when people were losing their homes. Remember that? The mortgages, they took on a mortgage, high interest rate perhaps, or the values were going up. The situation was such that people were losing their homes to the banks. And sometimes these people, all they needed was a few dollars to make the payment. It wasn't a lot of money that they needed to save their homes. And it was a big mitzvah, whoever can do so. But a rasha, or one who behaves like a rasha, would take advantage of these people to enrich themselves. You know, here I'm going to buy it off the bank for a low price where instead he could have done a big mitzvah and perhaps helped the individual maintain his home. This is a, it's a tremendous nisayon. So that is why he points this out over here, is that the rasha, or whoever has this kind of an attitude, is don't think that you can get away with it. But it's not just getting away with it, it's for the next pasuk. Because it may happen a righteous man can fall seven times. And, and rise, even after he fell seven times. But the wicked shall stumble upon evil. In other words, in the end, a rasha will fall and will not necessarily rise. He will stumble, he will make many mistakes. But the tzaddik, he may fall, but the Hashem, he will rise. So don't think that you can take advantage of these people. That's it. Their history, as they say, they're not going to come back. Be careful with that kind of an attitude. That's the attitude of a rasha, taking advantage of those who are weak, those who are struggling. But HaKadosh Baruch Hu, of course, sees everything, is aware of everything, and uh, he will listen to the cries of those who are being taken advantage of. He is aware of what's going on in people's minds and hearts, what their real intentions and real designs are. And that brings us to the next pasuk, which is a, is a similar attitude, which happens when your enemy falls do not rejoice and when he stumbles let your heart not exult and we're talking not necessarily about a non-Jewish enemy we're talking about a Jewish individual who you dislike 
you're not in good terms he is your competition whatever it may be you don't get along you don't like him he's your oyev when he falls do not be happy and some people you know are very happy when somebody slips on a banana peel they start laughing and we're not talking about children now because all children laugh because they think it's funny but for an adult to see something like that you know if you were to laugh it, it shows something about him you know but the, people do laugh and people do rejoice when other people don't make it when they lost their home they got fired something bad happened to them and that's what he's warning us over here about is do not be happy about this one this one is actually dangerous if you're happy about because you know what may happen Hashem may see what you're doing and he will be displeased and he will turn his wrath his anger away from him from that enemy and upon you in other words if Hashem was actually bringing about something against your enemy and you rejoice and you're happy with that that he has had a fall Hashem may say you know what that's the end of it I will cancel the decree against that individual and I will bring a chasmashal upon he who is being so happy with the plan. So this is a risky business. Therefore, if your enemy falls, and your enemy even means he who is harming you. We're not supposed to be happy when he who harms us, the Goy even, the true enemy, is, is having a downfall. He died. What should we be happy with? Instead, our attitude should be, Thank Hashem that our enemy is gone so that we are saved, so that we are protected. In other words, we don't focus on the downfall, on the demise of the enemy. He's a human being. As Akadosh Baruch Hu tells the Malachim, why are you about to say Shira when the Egyptians are drowning? Ma'asei yadai tovim bayam. These are Ma'asei yadai. I created them. And the same was with, with Yonah, the story with Yonah in Inveh. He was upset that HaKadosh Baruch did not overturn the city. Hashem tells him, what are you thinking about here? You know how many thousands of human beings and cattle there are in this city? Is it so easy for you to just do away with all of that? And many of them are ignorant. They don't know from right to left. It's just I should just, just because they sinned against me, I should not give them a chance? Obviously, Yonah was very, very protective of the Jewish people. He did not want the teshuvah of Ninveh to be an accusation. Here, Goyim are doing teshuvah, and the Jewish people are so stiff-necked, they're not doing teshuvah. He was, so I was, obviously that was his reasoning, why he was upset, you know. Here, Ninveh is going to do teshuvah. Nevertheless, HaKadosh Baruch Hu is concerned with everybody, even with those who are oivim. So the attitude should be what Amisal did afterwards, and said shirat hayam, for what purpose? that they were saved not because the Egyptians drowned in good for them we don't do that, we don't say that our attitude is that we're happy Kadosh Baruch Hu protected us and did miracles to us so same thing on a personal level if a person is is experiencing a situation where his enemy, his competition is gone he should be happy that Baruch Hashem Kadosh Baruch Hu blessed him that he can take over, that he can continue, that he can be successful not that the other individual has disappeared from the scene we're not happy when other people make mistakes, when other, other people fail. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a, it's not a, a nice midah. It shows a lack of maturity, a lack of understanding, a lack of sensitivity for, for human beings in general. But here the, he adds that it's also risky, it's dangerous. If you rejoice, then Hashem may change his mind. And not only cancel the punishment against he who, who it was intended for, but also bring it on the one who is rejoicing. Next pasuk, Al titchar bimre'im, Al titchar bamre'im, Al tikane barashaim. Also a very familiar pasuk, we've seen this idea before. Do not compete with evildoers, do not envy the wicked. Someone may be tempted to do what others have done, even though what they're doing is wrong, even though it's not kosher what they're doing, even though it's illegal. He may be tempted because he sees that they're successful, they weren't caught. Well, you know, there's a famous saying in Hebrew, Sof ganav letliyah. In the end, the thief is found and he's hanged. In other words, right now, you may see that he's getting away with it, but in the end, the bad guys are caught. 
So don't try to compete with them. And the, and the reason why he's that, emphasizing is that over here is because we are concerned, obviously, that one may imitate them, one may learn from their deeds. It's not just a matter of joining them in doing what they're doing. It's also, a matter, it's also an issue over here of learning from their ways. So you don't, you don't, you don't want to be envious of the wicked. There's nothing for you to, to, be, uh, to want to have for yourself from them. The reason for that is because of the next pasuk, he says, Kiloti ye acharit lara, It's interesting how he has to actually remind individuals, for there will be no future for an evil one, the lamp of the wicked will flicker. People actually believe, and that's why he's writing this, that these people are getting away with it, they're not being caught, and, you know, and they're becoming so rich, and if I do this, I can retire after five years. People get so, all sorts of ideas in their minds crooked, corrupt ideas why? because they see others doing it and they think if they did it, I can do it so be careful because even though it's true that right now they appear to be making it it's like a candle the lamp of the wicked will flicker in the end it will wicken in the end they will be caught, in the end they won't succeed he mentions here the word Ra and he mentions here the word Rashaim what's the difference between those who are evil and those who are wicked? So the commentators explain you can have an individual who is ra ima briot with people, and one who is wicked la shamaim only with Akadosh Baruch Hu. What's the difference? The commentators explain that there's a big difference in how Akadosh Baruch Hu handles evil doers, those who who are evil doers to society, to others, and those who are just evil with or wicked with Hashem. In other words, that they don't do the mitzvot properly, that they, they make transgressions. Those who are evil doers with other individuals, they will suffer ba'olam hazeh too. And eventually, it will catch up with them. The deen, midat ad-deen will catch up with them. In olam hazeh they will suffer in this world. Those who are just wicked, la shamaim with Hashem, Hashem may give them shalva, may give them peace and tranquility for 25 years, for whatever reason. And it may appear like they're, you know, they're getting away with it. But in the end, it catches up with them too. Or, even if he does not catch up with them in Olam Azeh, they died peacefully. They died in their sleep after the age of 92. And here they were mafia. All, all, how could this be? Because Hashem gives them the tranquility of this world to pay them in the next world. So there are all, there are all sorts of cheshbonot. But the point is that those who are evil with, with people, they will suffer the consequences in this world, in this lifetime. Next pasuk. Yera et Adonai b'ni v'melech im shonim al titarav. The translation is, My son, fear Hashem and the king, and do not mingle with dualists. One has to fear Hashem, and one also has to fear the king. And guess what? Sometimes there's a conflict between what the king says and what Hashem says, between what the law of the land says and what the Torah says. Even though there's something called dina de malchuta dina, that we do give kavod to the law, and we do respect the law, we try to abide by every law, right? Nevertheless, sometimes if there's a conflict, guess which one comes first? The Torah always comes first. Now there are situations where, of course, one needs to consult with a rabbi what to do. You know, it's a, it's a difficult situation. You don't want to get yourself in trouble with the law either. But the Torah is supreme. Even though there is Yira of Hashem and there is Yira of a Melech, which is rightly so, one has to fear the king, he is an authority, Nevertheless, Yirat Hashem comes first. And this issue comes up at home too. There's something called Kibbut Davayim. What if the father tells you one thing and the mother tells you something completely different? Who do you listen to? Anybody have any clue? Your mother will be very happy with you. Why listen to your mother? The halacha is you listen to your father because your mother has to listen to your father too. That's the obligation. I mean, there are priorities. We have to, there has to be a line drawn. Otherwise, you're going to be confused. What do you do now? Now, there are mitzvot that you're supposed to give your life even. Not every mitzvah you have to give your life. But if the situation allows, only if the situation allows for it, of course, the Torah always comes first. The Yirah of Hashem is, is supreme. Some people don't know this. That's why he's saying this. You know, you, you, of course, we have the fear for Hashem. We have the fear for a king. But Yirat Hashem is first. The Torah always comes first. The second part of the Pasuk, he says, Im shonim al titarav, do not 
mingle with dualists. What, what's dualists? Some say shoni means those that go against the law. They try to have it both ways. They try to play the game. In other words, of being good one day and doing things that are not appropriate the other day. Shonim, some say, means meshunim, those who are strange. In other words, you don't want to mess around with the wrong people who eventually will break the law. And guess what happens? If you befriended them, if you associated with them, you will be caught too. Just because your name and phone number was on their list. And when they get caught, and the police say, well, this man is on their list, and so he must be a crook just like them. So you don't want to mess around with these people. You don't want to have anything to do with them. You don't want to be on their list. And you don't want them to be on your list, of course. Where does this happen a lot? That people mess around or mingle with dualists, with, with all of these kinds of uh, characters. You know where this could happen easily? With drugs. There have been many stories of people who have asked, you know, can you do me a favor and take this suitcase for me? Just through customs. I have too much luggage with me or whatever, or some other excuse. And the guy really innocently did not know what he was doing. And sure enough, they decided to stop him, or some dog came and sniffed the suitcase, and he gets himself into jail. Now he has to defend himself. It's not mine. I, of course it's not yours, but, you know, we believe it's not yours, but you were involved. You did it for some money, you know. I mean, after all, why do people carry these suitcases? Because they want to get something out of it. Of course it's not yours. We don't think it's yours. We believe you, it's not yours. But you were doing this. You were helping someone. No, I, I, wasn't, I didn't even know what was in there. How are you going to prove that, that you didn't know? And some people end up being 25 years in jail for doing something like this. Now, obviously, everything is in a shamayim. You know, if somebody got punished like that, there is a cheshbon. But one has to be careful, not lechatchila. If he knows, if he's aware, then for sure not to be involved. Even though the Yetzirah might tell him, well, nobody's going to know. They don't stop people these days. And just on that day when you decided to go, they are stopping everyone. So you don't want to mess around with these people. Why not? He explains in the next pasuk, Ki pitom yakum edam ufid shenehem miyodea. The translation is, For suddenly their misfortune will rise. In other words, all of a sudden their misfortune will come. And the ruin of both of them, who knows? In other words, who knows what's going to happen to them? how many years in jail they're going to be as a result of what they did. So you don't want to be a part of that. It can happen all of a sudden, out of nowhere. People make this mistake time after time after time, even though he wrote this so many, so, so many years ago. People don't learn. People don't listen. And it's interesting, you know. It's just people repeat, repeat, repeat all these mistakes. Even though it's written beforehand, be careful with politicians, be careful with bad people, don't trust people too much. It, it, all of this good advice was written and emphasized and repeated so many times and people still make the mistakes. That's why it's important to review these pesukim, this advice. The next few pesukim speak to the chacham, to the good man. Till now we were speaking to the rasha or to the one who was contemplating mingling with the, the rasha. Gam ele lachachamim, haker panim bemishpat bal tov. These two are for the wise, for the chachamim, to have respect for persons or for people in judgment is not good. A chacham, a shofet, a judge has to be careful, lo lakir panim, not to show favoritism to one more than to the other. We're not talking right now about making a mistake, in other words, in the judgment necessarily, or doing something not according to the halacha. Here we're just talking about lakir panim, to give more kavod to one individual more than to the other, to show him more respect. Two people are in front of you, they're both alike. They're both guilty. Until you figure out who's not. Right? The first two come, they have to be completely equal. You don't look at the fact that one is the president of the community, that the other one is a big rabbi, that the other one is uh, some very prestigious person. You have to be careful to treat everybody fairly, not to show more kavod for, to one than, than to the other. So these, are, these words are being said to Chachamim. These words are being said to the judges. That they too need to be careful with certain areas that they, you know, they may sometimes forget. After all, we're only human. And we make mistakes. And we know that this man is a very important individual. And if we would see him in the street, we would treat him one way. 
But when it comes to court, when it comes to halakha, when it comes to judgment, we have to be fair, we have to be... Because imagine showing one individual more kavod. Imagine, what, what is the other person feeling now? He's going to have a hard time um, expressing himself. You know, here he has a case that he prepared. He prepared well, he's his own lawyer. Comes along this other individual who sits next to him, or on the other side. And the judge shows him more kavod. His ta'anot, all his claims, istatmu. In other words, they will be blocked. He will have a hard time to opening up his mouth. He won't. He will be like in a shock. What is he going to say? So the chacham, the judge, has to be careful not to show any favoritism, not to give more kavod to one than to the other. The next pasuk says as follows: Omer le rasha tzadikata yikavu amim. We're talking about a normal individual who may be flattering the rasha by telling him he who says to a wicked man you are righteous people will curse him nations will be wroth with him those will be angry at him everybody will be upset at him what's going on over here why should a tzaddik say to a rasha or why should a normal person say to a rasha that you are righteous you're good you're fine don't worry about it that's called flattery it's called hanufa in Hebrew. Everybody know here what flattery means? There's a lot of uh, ways of saying the same thing in, in slang, but I'm not going to say it. In other words, when, when people sometimes try to... Huh? Buttering up. Yeah, something like that. To somebody either to get a uh, to get something from them or just to make them feel good. It's a sur. If the person did something wrong, you're supposed to point it out to him. But a lot of people hesitate for whatever reason could be their shame too you're supposed to point it out and for sure at least not to do the opposite no don't worry about it you're okay it's fine Hashem will, will forgive you like when they gave the uh, Nobel Peace Prize to uh, Yasser Arafat yeah exactly <laughs> yeah similar so one has to be careful not to show any flattery to a Rasha why not the, the three the three things that come out of it first of all a person that shows Hanufa flattery to a rasha, because he needs something from him, it shows that he has no bitachon in Hashem, that his emuna is weak. In other words, you have to flatter him to get your job, you have to flatter him to get the favor from him. Is that what you have to do to come to, the, to what you're trying to come to? So it's a lack of bitachon. Also, when you give flattery to a rasha, you are giving him encouragement, and you are basically supporting his ways. Justifying justifying him, which means that he will continue doing what he's doing. And number three, it could be that what he's doing is so bad that by you agreeing with him, you are allowing him to harm people too, to harm society. Give you an example. Even though it's not flattery, but one is not allowed to turn over a Jew to authorities. Just like that. To the goyim who will, who will hurt him, for sure not. But even just to turn him over to authority, you can't. That's, you cannot, you know, give information about another Jew just like that, unless this individual is harming society. He's a danger to society. That's a that's a whole different idea. So, he, what? If somebody is a danger to society, he's a rapist. Of course, you you're supposed to get him away. What if he's a white collar criminal? Same thing. If he is a con artist and people are falling because today, of him? Today you see that a lot of people, they're really abusing the medical and medical, they got a lot of money. They put on somebody else's name and they go there and do the stuff there like that. What you no, no, uh, no, it has to be harming people directly. Society. You know, society. Just, you know, if, he, if it's a personal issue with that individual with the government, you don't have to get involved with that. A person who's a who's danger to society, you know, people are going to fall in his trap. He's a con artist. He's a crook, uh, or something even worse than that. You, of course, you have no choice. That man belongs in jail, not in the street. So that's that's the the problem here with Hanufa. Person has to be very strong and not be afraid of 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 telling the Rasha that he's wrong, just like a judge has to be courageous and not be afraid that 
he's going to find guilty the president of the community or whoever that may be. The Torah says, don't be scared of anybody. We only have fear for Hashem. We have no fear for human beings. So when it comes to Hanufa, it's the opposite. At least take, at least be quiet. At least, and we're going to see, we're going to see, be quiet is also not a good idea. But Hanufa is the worst thing you can do. That's the flatter to give him encouragement, to, to demonstrate to him that what he's doing is right. I mean, that's a, that's a big sin. It's 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 just going to perpetuate the problem. Hypocrisy? Yeah. Why is it hypocrite? Because you are saying something that is not real. Oh, obviously, yeah, because when you flatter, you're not being truthful. You're, yeah. Now, we're not here talking about giving words of encouragement to somebody who needs encouragement. Flattery is not encouragement. Flattery is, some, is completely wrong. In other words, the, the individual is doing something not right, and you are saying how good he is, or you're just giving him words of praise when you don't really mean it. That's also a form of flattery. You can do that at home with your wife. Rabbis tell us because it, it contributes to Shalom Bait. It's therefore permissible. But outside the home, you have to be careful. It's, I agree with you. I mean, it's a form of hypocrisy. But it's, it's worse than that when you're dealing with Terasha. You're allowing him to continue to do whatever he was doing. That leads us to the next pasuk, Those who do rebuke, or those who reprove, he says here, it will be pleasant for them, and a good blessing should come upon them. There might be some individuals who think, what use is it, what use is it for me to reprove, to rebuke, to give musar, nothing will come out of it. On the contrary, I will make enemies, people will not like me, if I point out their mistakes, if I criticize them. He says, you don't have to worry about that. If you do it in the, in the right way, you don't, of course, show your anger. You don't hit them. You know, if you do it in a nice, gentle, tactful way, those who give Musar, it will be pleasant, and they will receive the Barakah from Hashem, that they will succeed. Now, and why is it really important for them to give Musar? Three reasons. First of all, you have a chance of actually changing an individual here, of influencing him. You have a chance you may actually change his attitude, his mind. You never know. So try, you have at least a 50-50 chance in many cases. We don't know until we try. That's number one. Number two, when you see something being done wrong and you keep quiet, it's like you agree with it. So when you come up to the Shamayim later on, they will tell you you're guilty of this. I'm guilty, I've never done this. Yeah, but you saw others doing it, you didn't say anything. If you didn't say anything, it's like you did it yourself. Because when you are quiet, you approve. When you approve, it's like you are a partner to what is being done. So therefore, if, if you have any influence, you for sure have to do it. If you at least have to try to give Musar, to point it out. And the third idea of giving Musar is Kol Yisrael, <coughs> Kol Yisrael Arevin Zelazeh. Zelazeh means that all of Amisal has a responsibility for each other. If we see a Jew who does not know, maybe, then we have to point it out to him. We have the responsibility to teach. Aravi means that we are guarantors. We are guarantors for the transmittal of the Torah to future generations. And if one does not have it, we have to see if we can help him. So we have that responsibility whether we want it or not. So the ones who give Musa have nothing to be concerned about. On the contrary, they will be blessed by Hashem. Next pasuk, Sefataim Yishak Meshiv Devarim Nechokim. Lips should kiss him who gives a right answer. This pasuk really deals with tact and with the proper answers. When a person says something, it is important that he be clear and that he knows exactly what he's saying. One should organize his thoughts, his, his ideas, or what he's about to say before he says them. So they should come out right. Because it can make a big difference. When one is prepared to say something, whether it's a speech or to give a lesson, and he knows clearly what he's going to say, and he organizes his thoughts properly, it's going to come out good. And what's going to, what's going to happen if his ideas are expressed beautifully? Sefataim Yishak. Then he deserves to be kissed. In other words, the lips that spoke beautiful words deserve to be kissed. You know, it's an expression here that he's... You know, of approval. It's something very nice. 
he deserves all the credit for saying for expressing beautiful thoughts so therefore it's a good idea to organize your thoughts let's say you have somebody to convince a relative of yours who's very difficult to convince he's very stubborn he always very argumentative if you just start having an argument with him you may not get anywhere but if you if you come in advance you know you're gonna having dinner tonight with with this part of the family that is not so observant and you prepare yourself beforehand okay let me see how am I gonna say it what am I gonna say what is he gonna say I'm gonna say that if he's gonna say that you, you're gonna have a better <laughs> hopefully a better experience and you have maybe even a better chance of convincing them so one who does so one who's prepared he deserves a lot of credit here he's talking about the order of how we do things in life. The translation is like this. Prepare your work outside and make it fit in the field for yourself. Afterwards you should build your house. In other words, find yourself a job, make some money, and then build a home, and then get married. Shlomo Melech is pointing out the order, as the Rambam does, as it is mentioned elsewhere, that the proper order of how things should be in life, how they should be, not as they always turn out to be, is work, make some money, build a house, or buy a house, and get married. Today, however, if you do that, you will have white hair by the time you're ready to buy your house. Because homes today cost over a million dollars. So, it used to be, I remember, 1970. 1970, that was 36 years ago. You can buy a house here in Los Angeles, in this neighborhood. All you needed was four years of an average salary. Average salary of the time, four years of it. Four years of an average salary. Most people didn't have that money, right? But if you put down a down payment, you'd be able to pay off your home in a number of years. All it was is four times an average salary. Not a lot of money. Today, you need 20 times an average salary to buy a fixer-upper. Just a fixer-upper. An average salary. 20 times that average salary, approximately. See what has happened? You know, people don't have that money. It's very difficult. So therefore, what do you do today? You don't push off your wedding. You don't push off getting married until you made all the money. You get married as soon as possible. You pray to Hashem that He should allow you to meet up with your badzu, with your soulmate, the sooner the better. And even a college education, which for some is important because that's what, that's what will allow them to have a profession. They're not going to be in business. They actually need to learn something. Even that, you don't have to wait till you finish. It's okay to get married before. On condition, of course, two conditions that you know what you're going to be doing so that you can support your wife as soon as in a, in a reasonable amount of time you know, where you, you know where you're headed and number two it helps if you have support from the parents, from the in-laws why not? That's what, that's what a lot of people do today in order for them to be able to continue their education in yeshiva, in kolel, in a, in a school it's only because the parents on two sides are able to help out Otherwise, we would not be able to do that either, to continue to learn. So this order is the ideal order. You, you've made some money, you've bought a home, and now you get married. Can anybody do that today? I mean, it's very difficult. At 22, 23, who can purchase a house? You know, and that's already late, going to the Chachamim, if that's when you want to get married. So what if you live in the park for the first couple of years? don't have a house the first couple years. Right. So that's, that's obviously the only alternative. You have to rent. That's what I'm saying today. You don't have that prerogative of making some money, buying a house, right, and getting married. It's almost impossible. You have to either rent an apartment or unless you have some help, you know, to support yourself. But one should have a direction of where he's headed by the time he's getting married because you do want to provide. You don't want to rely on others. You want to do something for yourself. You want to, you know, learn a trade. So you have to have, by the time you're getting ready to get married, even though you may not have all that money, you may not have the home that he's talking about here, but at least you should have a direction of where you want to go, what you want to do, and have some, some sort of, uh, of support, either from the parents or from some other source. 
But that would be the right order. It's first to work, then to build a home, and then to get married. That's one interpretation of this pasuk. But right now it's impossible. Right now you need two people to work. Now you need sometimes the two people to work. Sure, sure. And you need to work sometimes like overtime too, a second job. Yeah, yeah. Some commentaries tell us that what Shlomo Melech here is emphasizing is as follows. Work as much as you can out of your home. You don't want to be at home too much because you're going to end up fighting with your wife. Yeah, so I don't know if this was meant in a humorous way, but there's some truth to this. I've met a lot of people who, even though they're in their 70s, they're still working. I said, why are you working? I don't want to be at home. They were, you know, they were very, very honest, you know, that they, at home, they have a very hard time. So in order for them to have strong bite, they're always not at home. Another idea that is expressed in this pasuk, is that one should be prepared to work for others first, and then to work for himself. There's a lot of people who just want to be independent, do not want to work for others. So he says it's okay for you to start out working for others. It's not, there's nothing wrong with that. Be an employee, an apprentice, and then you will be able to go on your own. Another interpretation of this pasuk, the rabbis tell us that Shlomo Melech said what he said also in concerning learning. That one has to learn, prepare himself to learn halachot, to learn what, what there is to learn as much as possible before he gets married. Once you get married, you become very busy. Not everybody is like you over here who is able to commit themselves to come to shiur especially if there are babies in the house, changing the diapers, helping the wife. Uh, there's a lot of uh, responsibilities. People are tired after a long day of work. So therefore learn as much as you can before you get married. Those are the most precious years, the years that we are in yeshiva. I wish I had those years now. You know, when one was able to learn for 17 hours a day, you know what that is? It was the most beautiful, the most beautiful years to be able to not have to worry about anything. Just learn. Eat breakfast, lunch, dinner, and shachrit min harvit, and of course occasionally do a little bit of laundry, right? And just learn. If you're serious, that's what you would do. So it's about all. How do you spend the 17 hours? Even if you start 8 o'clock in the morning, yeah. o'clock at night time is 12 hours. Right. You save it to, to, to 12 o'clock at night time? Or 1 o'clock in the morning? Yeah, about... 8 o'clock in the morning, just yeah. 1 o'clock in the morning with 17 hours. Yeah. I figure 12 hours a day is a big thing. Yeah, I know, but some, it wasn't every day maybe like that. It wasn't maybe every day. No, no, I was doing it. Possibly. It wasn't every day, but it was, it was more than 12 hours. It was more than 12 hours. I was doing 18 hours a day. Yeah. Going to college, working. Sure, it's possible. 18, you believe it, it yeah. 18 hours. Yeah, yeah. That's how it, it came out, I remember. It came out like that on some days. Yeah, in the yeshiva world. Sometimes, not every day, obviously. Shabbat it wasn't like that, and Friday for sure it wasn't like that. But there were days that were long, very long days. Yeah. Next pasuk. He translates here, do not be a witness without cause for your friend, that you should be enticed with your lips. In order to understand this, one has to learn the Gemara that deals with Eid Echad. There's sometimes a problem when one witness observes an incident and in order for this incident to be recorded, in order for Bentin to do something about it, there has to be at least two witnesses. So if only one witness appears and says what he saw, what are you doing it for? You're only being motzi shemra. You're only accusing an individual of having done something that maybe is not true. So he's warning an individual of being careful not to just be a single sole witness in a situation, means that you can easily be carried away with your lips by talking too much. Even if you know it is really true and you will a witness, still you don't do it? Depending what the situation is. There are sometimes, uh, there are halachot where ed echad ne'eman, where one witness is believed in a certain situation. A woman, for example. Yeah. Depending on, what do you mean with a woman? Let's say she says that uh, you believe it, the same mouth that makes you ulcer, the same mouth that makes you look Right, yeah. But there's also certain isurin that an edechad is believed, or if, uh, you know, a woman needs to know what happened to her husband, 
the, the rabbis were, of course, lenient about uh, agunot. A woman should not remain stuck, not knowing what happened to her husband. Is he dead? Did he disappear? So we rely uh, even on incid incidental things that, uh, that serve as some proof that the husband really died. But otherwise, uh, what I'm talking about over here is, that, that is, is a little bit more serious, is, is having observed an avera, having observed a sin, you know, uh, we have to, depending on if this individual is a good man or not, if he has an otherwise good reputation, if you're going to accuse him of having uh, done something, it's Motsi Shemra on him. It could be baseless. There was, a, there was a story with a rabbi, a very prominent rabbi, who uh, was accused by some people in the community. And these people, of course, are, are the type of individuals who you shouldn't take them seriously. They're not serious individuals. But anyway, people talk. They were willing to swear that they saw the rabbi eating on Yom Kippur. It turned out after investigation that the, the rabbi did carry some food and drink in his hands on Yom Kippur, but he was taking it to a Yolede, to a woman who had just given birth, who needed to eat and drink a little bit on Yom Kippur. These individuals who outside, not close by, outside, from a distance, saw the rabbi with the food, they already drew the conclusion. He had the food in hand. He ate. Did they see him eat? Put it? No. So that's, of course, the problem with uh, judging people favorably, giving them the benefit of the doubt. That's a whole different idea. But nevertheless, it's the same thing here. When, when it's one, it's even worse. Because one does not have the same power as two. Next, Pasuk. Al tomar kasher asa li ken lo ashiv leish kafa olo. Do not say as he did to me, so I will do to him. I will repay the man according to his deed. This pasuk and the next pasuk, we're talking about nekama, taking revenge. Since he gave me a bad name, I'm going to do so to him. Rabbi tell us, Bishvil chote echad she'asa she'loke hogen. Because of a sinner who did something wrong, just because of him, we should do things wrong. In other words, we shouldn't do things properly. Just because one, this one individual did it wrong? No. If, if, if he did it, then he will be responsible for his action. It doesn't mean that we have to do what he did. So don't think to repay somebody just, just because he did this to you. And the same is true with any, any form of nekama. person did not want to lend you his car. Now you need his... You, didn't want, you did not want to lend him your car. Now he needs... One second. The, he did not lend you the car, and now he is asking you to lend him the car. No, I'm not going to lend him because he didn't lend me. Same thing, all of this is a form of nekama that is not right. Just because somebody makes a mistake, just because somebody does something wrong, doesn't mean you have to behave like him. It's stood down to his level. But you are still not obligated. To do what? You are not obligated to lend him your car. You? No, you're not obligated to lend, but you should, if that's your only motive of not giving it to him because he didn't give it to you, that's called nekama. That's revenge. The last few pesukim of the Perek talk again about the lazy man. And as I've said before, apparently Shlomo Melech puts a big emphasis on laziness throughout the Perek, throughout the whole Sefer, because of what he's about to say now. By the fields of a lazy man I passed and by the vineyard of a man without sense. What's a man without sense? A man who did not learn. A man who, who does not have the knowledge. And as a result of not having the knowledge, he behaves in some ways like the lazy man. And what happens to these individuals, to their fields? He translates over here, Behold, thistles had grown all over it, nettles had covered its surface. Harulim and kipshonim are types of thorns that grow in a field that has been abandoned. And its stone fence had been torn down. Shlomo Melech has observed, having passing by these kind of fields, but look what has happened to what could have been a potentially beautiful field or vineyard. It's all covered with thorns because the owner is lazy or hasar lev. He has no understanding, no, no knowledge of how to upkeep it. 
And as a result of that, not only has it grown thorns, Geder Avanav Nerasa, the wall that's around it, has also broken down. The fence has been torn down. Who is he talking about? Not just a lazy man. He's also talking about somebody who has learned Torah and who has not reviewed. If you do not review what you learn, the rabbis tell us, not only will you forget what you've learned, but you will come to say on what's Tameh Tahor and on what's Tahor Tameh. The comparison here with a field or a, vi- or a vineyard that, that the fence has been torn down is not only, not only is it not being developed properly, but even that which was there before, which was beautiful, has been destroyed. And that's a shame. And all of that from laziness or from not reviewing what one has learned. So he says like this, Now Shlomo Melech is telling about himself. And I said to myself, I applied this to my heart, I saw and learned a lesson, how terrible it is to be lazy. You know, what laziness can bring about. In other words, this is something which brings about a great loss. Chaval. Commentaries explain that this is also talking about the nefesh. The nefesh is a spirit, a human being needs work, just like a field needs to be plowed and need, you, you need to put seeds if you want it to grow. Same thing with the nefesh. If you want to accomplish a lot, you want the ma'asim to be good ma'asim, then the nefesh has to be plowed and seeded. In the same way, it has to be t- tilled. Just like you would till the field, one has to work on himself and his midot. The tikkun amidot is very important in order for the ma'asim, for one's deeds to come out right. It just doesn't happen by itself. Some people need more, some people need less. It all depends on what kind of a nefesh and what kind of a yetzer they have. But it requires continuous development. Otherwise, the person becomes lazy. Just like one's diet. People who have a very big stomach, what's the conclusion? It's not that they're overeating, maybe they're not eating a lot. They're not necessarily eating a lot. So they're just not taking care of themselves, whatever it is. They're not exercising enough, they're not walking enough, and you know, they're not controlling what they eat, maybe. So it's a person is ignoring, he's ignoring himself, like the one who's ignoring his field, letting go. That's the way, that's the reason it looks the way it looks. It's a shame. So how does he, how does he finish the Perek? with some advice on how to overcome this laziness. Laziness. What? Which one? Slavery? Laziness. 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 He says, Me'at shenot, me'at tenumot, me'at chibuk yadayim lishkav. Little sleep, little slumber, little clasping of the hands to lie down. In other words, don't oversleep. That's one place to begin, to control the amount of hours one needs to sleep. The Rambam says eight hours is enough. And that's usually for the younger. I, I believe, that's what they've told me, that the older you get, the less sleep you need. So maybe you don't need as much. But some people, nevertheless, allow themselves to sleep. They take a nap in the afternoon. They say, oh, they oversleep. Man. And what happens as a result of all the sleep? You waste time. Time that can, you cannot bring back. It's gone. It has disappeared. Well, one can have been so productive with all this time and accomplished so much. Instead, he decided to sleep. Just, just lay down in bed and do nothing. The first, the first place to begin is with the sleep. Less sleep, the better. It's the last pasuk of the Perek. Then your poverty will come strolling and you're once like an armed man. In other words, if you do continue to sleep, if you do continue with the laziness, then one will become poor. You will become unemployed. You will be without a job. And it will come kiishm again. It will come down like an armed man. I think what he's trying to say here is like when an armed man rushes to war, rushes to battle, in the same way the poverty will strike an individual who is lazy. And he's said this before too. He just, for, for greater emphasis, is telling us that if a person does not do anything about it, this is what will happen to him. He eventually will lose his job. And this is what happens also, by the way, to an alcoholic. You know, alcoholic does not only ruin his health, he ruins his family, he loses his job. It's these kind of symptoms, they're not controlled, they're destructive. And laziness is also destructive. Look what happened to the field, another, another otherwise beautiful field. 
So therefore the midah to overcome this is a rizut, to be diligent, to, to not oversleep, to be in control of oneself. When one of course knows what he wants to accomplish in life, when one is ambitious, when one is anxious to succeed, then obviously he is more careful. But if a person is a hasar lev, which is a very interesting way of describing an individual who doesn't care, he has no heart, that means he doesn't care, this is what he will do. He will smoke, he will, he will drink, even though you, you're telling him, listen, you're killing yourself. Don't you care about your kids? He's a hasar lev. He has no heart. He has no understanding. He hasn't learned enough. And as a result of that, he's having a hard time controlling himself. It's, it's also, of course, a matter of, of, uh, of desire, of interest. It's not just a lack of understanding. A person has to have a will, a desire to succeed, a desire to control himself. Uh, some people give up too quickly. I, I oversimplified it. You know, every situation is different. But the common denominator is that some people don't care, don't care enough about themselves whether smoking, drinking, or laziness, and that is why they look the way they look. So therefore he says, I took this to heart. I paid attention, I observed this, and this is the conclusion that I came to, that one of the, one of the worst things that a person can, one of the worst midot that a person can possess is the absolute. Not only does he not accomplish a lot, but any accomplishment that he may have had, he's learned, he learned for many years in the yeshiva. He doesn't review all his learning, now he will be ashamed, he will forget everything. So therefore, it requires upkeep, the learning. One's marriage requires upkeep too, maintenance. And so does everything else in life. If you want it to look good, you have to invest in it.